Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and it's my pleasure to welcome our guests this evening. Ijoma Aluo describes herself as a writer, speaker, and internet yeller whose work focuses primarily on issues of race and identity, feminism, social and mental health, social justice, and the arts. Her book, So You Want to Talk About Race, took a frank look at this country's institutionally racist political, economic, and social systems. A New York Times bestseller, it garnered wide critical acclaim and was named to a host of 2018 best of the year lists and landed at the top of the Times list again this past summer. Aluo has been named one of the most influential people in Seattle by Seattle Magazine and was a winner of the 2018 Feminist Humanist Award by the American Humanist Society. Her new book, Mediocre, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America, is described by Michael Eric Dyson, who will be back here in February, as a master class in understanding how systems of domination working relentlessly in the service of white male patriarchy not only harm all women and people of color, but ultimately hinder white men themselves from reaching greatness. Tonight, Ms. Aluo will be in conversation with award-winning broadcaster, journalist, and longtime friend of the Free Library of Philadelphia, Tracy Matisak, and our ASL interpreter is Megan. Tracy and Ijoma, the screen is yours. And welcome everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight. Really looking forward to our conversation. And uh, as you know, if you have been attending uh, many of these kinds of author events, we budget time for your questions for our guests uh, following our conversations. So do make sure that you uh, add your questions to the question list. You'll see the icon at the bottom of your screen and we will get through as many as we have time to get through. But that said, uh, what do you say we dive into the book? Ijoma Oluo, it is a delight to have an opportunity to talk with you. Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thanks for having me. So I want to start off with the title of the book, Mediocre, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. Pretty provocative title. Uh, where does that come from? Um, you know, it's funny as people always say that's a really provocative title, but I, I think it, it's, you know, it's a term, of course, that Sarah Hagee kind of entered into the zeitgeist of mediocre white men um, with a tweet that she came out with years ago that I think it was, it said something like, um, try to move with the confidence of a mediocre white man. And it was recognized immediately because those of us who have worked and lived with these kind of mediocre white men and seen what it costs us um, and how, how much it's rewarded to pretend like you know what you're doing, even if you don't, to go through the world thinking that you are entitled to leadership. Um, and, and it's only rewarded for certain people. So for me, the title came really naturally. And then when, and, you know, when people start saying, oh, that's provocative, I was just like, wait, oh, so we're not calling it this anymore? Did, are we not saying what it is? And, um, you know, for me, I just, I prefer to say a thing. And I, I don't know many women of color, especially who have worked in any sort of, you know, mixed environment, um, who have voted anyone in, you know, helped vote anyone into office, who hasn't talked about this phenomenon in a way that I think anyone who would be interested in the book would be unfamiliar with what we're saying. So yeah, it was really, that was the first thing that came to me um, was the title. That was the first thing I really sent to my um, agent when I had the idea for the book. And then afterwards people were like, how did you come up with it? And I was like, that's just literally how we talk about this. And, and I don't really believe in kind of, you know, beating around a topic. So, and we want to clarify that you're not saying that all white men are mediocre or that any, you know, gender or race is predisposed to mediocrity, correct? Correct. And I, I don't think, I mean, there were just, you know, if, if, they, if that were the case, there would be no reason to write the book. I mean, that would just be a thing that we would get used to and move on um, and try to work around <laughs> if I thought there wasn't a problem that could be solved. Um, if I if I thought this wasn't a, you know a social and cultural you know construct um, that we could work on, then honestly I would just be spending my time in, in you know in what is you know really depressing and you know um, horrific 
instances throughout our history for no reason. And I'm not like a masochist like that. So what we're talking about is a deliberately constructed identity. And the reason why I wrote the book is because I want people to understand when they're looking at news stories, when they're looking at what happened in the Capitol um, and saying, how did it get like this? What happened? Why are these white men so angry? Why are they, you know, why are they so violent? What is happening? Or why can't our Congress get anything done? That this is by design, that it's not a fluke. Um, it's not an accident and it's not sudden that this is the design over hundreds of years. And I want people to see this because these systems have been designed by people. And the only way that we can create something new is by confronting it. And so I believe, you know, that this is not in the nature of people to behave this way. It's not in the nature of white men. And it, it, I don't even believe it is the majority of white men who are, you know, at least the most egregious in this. But we as a society reward this behavior and we construct norms that expect this behavior. And it is supported by our systems. And these systems cause great harm yeah. to people who don't live up to these goals and to all women and people of color and people who aren't men. And it's really vital that we look at it. Well, I want to drill down on that a little bit because you do say early on in the book that all of us are complicit in upholding what you describe as white male superiority and that all of us, including white men, are the worst for it. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, um, certainly. You know, it's our systems are things that we are meant to believe are natural and normal, right? So we watch TV and we have these idealized visions of how our families are supposed to work, how our government's supposed to work, what our leaders look like. We see this in our history books, right? We see this in our political ad campaigns. We read it in our newspapers and we all play our part in it. We are all assigned roles in this hierarchy. And we're also told what we need to do personally for success. And so, you know, as a, as a black woman, right, in business, there have always been these ideas, these books, right, on how to play the game, how to emulate this idea of white manhood to get ahead, right? And as I play into that, and as I say, this white man looks like a leader because he looks this way in a suit and tie, he talks this particular way. And that's completely divorced from actually what he creates in business, the environment and the leadership skills he truly has. I am supporting it. And I'm also supporting it when I emulate that, right? So we all play a part and we have to investigate it because that's what makes the system run. You know, if we were to break it up, there, there aren't enough white men in the country to be upholding this system completely on their own. We all play the part in many ways and some of us more than others. So many white women who often feel like their proximity to power lies in their proximity to white men will uphold it because they will uphold this power structure for their husbands, for their sons, for their brothers, because that gives them a semblance of safety and security. For many people of color, we are told to uphold it as well because that's our chance out, right? It's our chance out of poverty, mm -hmm. our chance out of obscurity. And what we're doing is upholding this you know, exploitative and racist and sexist system. And so we have to look at that because we can't just say, do better while we still reward people doing the things that they're doing right now. We have to look at where we are complicit, but we also have to look at it there because that's where we have the most power. It's a lot easier for us to change what we do and, and to move within our spheres of influence than to read what other people are doing, get mad at them and then expect them to suddenly do different, mm. right? And so it's vital, you know, I, I, I want my work to be useful. I want people to look and say, okay, what can I do with this? Um, and, you know, sometimes the step where we're at is at least understanding the scope of the problem. And I feel like that's what mediocre really aims to do. It's not necessarily um, how to fix things. It's more of a diagnostic. This is what it looks like. Because I think we are very far behind in understanding these constructed identities. And we have to first get it but we have to you know, understand our place in it. Yeah. I'm curious because of the timing of the book to what degree Donald Trump might have been part of the inspiration. Um, you know, it was, he was sort of an inspiration, but more it was the conversations surrounding him that were an inspiration, right? I've been writing about race and gender since before Donald Trump was president. But when the election started, there was this shift, right? as if Trump came out of nowhere, as if he just magically appeared mm. and built himself out of nothing. And people 
you know, it, it, it was very dangerous even from the beginning because it allowed us to look at him divorced from society and say, what's his problem? And not what's our problem that got him on this stage and where he is. Um, and when you are someone who spends a lot of time trying to get people to understand what needs to change in our system, and then suddenly you have this big evil force that you can blame for everything, it pulls attention away from what actually needs to be done in the system. So for me, the frustration wasn't necessarily with Trump, but with the way people were able to say, it is all Trump, as if if we remove Trump, the problem would go away. It's Trump supporters as if they just magically appeared and weren't people you know, raised up in these systems. And so when you see this, especially as a writer, and you saw these think pieces coming up in 2016, and, and later saying, you know, what's with the new angry white man? And you're a black woman who's been dealing with this angry white man your whole life. Um, you recognize the danger in acting like this is just, um, like each individual white man has a solo story that isn't connected to our systems and to our broader culture. And so that's where I would say Trump kind of, you know, while he does feature in the book, and I think a lot of people were surprised that he's not center stage in a book about white male mediocrity, um, that's on purpose, you know, because I want people to understand because, you know, he, we deal with him for a limited period of time. Yeah. But the people who enabled him and the person who will follow him or, you know, whomever comes up trying to use the similar model to power, we're going to have to recognize these patterns. Otherwise, we're going to have the same problem over and over again. The first chapter of the book is called Cowboys and Patriots. And you write about the growth fueled by social media that um, of these violent militia groups and, and the domestic terror um, that they represent. Now, certainly you could not have known at the time that you were writing this book that shortly after the release, we would see this armed insurrection at the Capitol that you mentioned just a moment ago. And I, I just wonder what went through your mind on January 6th as you watched all of that unfold. Um, you know, one thing I will say, you know, I live in the West, which is where a lot of these groups come from, right? And we're seeing this now as, um, where a lot of the starts and the spokesmen, you know, for the spokespeople for this, and we see that the Bundy brothers are in the forefront of a lot of these movements still to this day. Um, when I finished researching and writing that chapter, I was filled with such a sense of dread and alarm, mm. knowing that that was that that the worst was still yet to come. And recognize, you know, even in the book, as as Betsy Coleman was saying, they were looking for their next battle. Yeah, and Ijoma, we should stop there and, and remind us about the Bundy brothers for those who have not read the book or maybe don't remember because it's been a few years since those standoffs, but just kind of if, in a nutshell, remind us of their story. Yes, so the, you know, for people who want to understand how a group of mostly white men could storm the Capitol and not fear reprisal, you should look at the case of the Bundy brothers. Mm -hmm. um, the Bundy brothers had a, um, were ranchers living, I believe in Utah, and they had a long, their family had a long standoff with the federal government. Um, they are um, religious fundamentalists who believe the federal government doesn't have a right to land outside of Washington, DC. Um, and basically use this as an excuse to not pay grazing fees and to kind of destroy the environment around them by letting their cattle graze wherever and not pay anything for the upkeep of the land for other people to be able to use. Um, and they had an armed standoff first with the federal government who confiscated their cattle after decades of refusing to pay their fees. Um, and they literally had snipers in position aimed at federal officers. The, the federal officers had to back off. And it was two years, I believe, until they faced any consequences for that. Mm -hmm. The consequences they faced came after, only after, emboldened by not facing consequences then, they decided to take over a federal land reserve mm -hmm. in Oregon. And the, the brothers, um, the sons of Clive and Bundy, came with followers and weapons and thousands and thousands of, of um, you know, rounds of ammunition and took over for a month a federal, federal lands for the Malheur um, Wildlife Refuge. They destroyed sacred native um, artifacts that were kept there. Um, they trampled over the land and then had an armed standoff where so one person died that kind of ended this whole thing. Mm -hmm. They 
then after trial, were not sentenced. They were, they were not found guilty. And the people that they were supposedly, um, you know, holding the standoff in, in defense of, which were two ranchers who had been in prison for arson, for setting fires on federal land, were then pardoned by Trump. And so the message that went across the country, um, you know, first in you know 2015 with the standoff, then when they were found not guilty, and then when Trump later pardoned the remainders that had kind of inspired this, was I'm on your side. And there were whole movements around this, and it wasn't just this one religious sect. When they took over, white supremacist groups from the entire region joined them anti-government groups from the entire region joined them. And these were groups that had been growing largely in numbers since the election of Obama. And because they never faced any consequences and because Trump made a hero of them, they've been growing and growing in number and looking for the next opportunity to accelerate their battle against federal government and to kind of support broader white supremacy. So in studying that, and also knowing our family had been targeted by offshoots of this same group, groups that they were affiliated with, um, you know, I knew that it was just going to get worse. So when we saw people storming the federal, um, federal, the, storming the Capitol, I was not surprised. Like, I, you know, I wouldn't, I didn't wake up going, this is what's going to happen today. But did I think that there were going to be battles brought to federal buildings and federal offices if Trump was removed from office, or even if he wasn't? Absolutely. Because if you study these groups and see how heavily armed they are, you know, in Washington state where we live here, we have a, a state rep who was indicted on federal charges of like trying to commit treason and sedition. Wow. And they wouldn't arrest him because he's protected by the militias in the eastern part of the state. Wow. And they are afraid of the violence that will ensue. And I think a lot of people who maybe don't live in the West don't understand how heavily armed these groups are and how much they've been searching um, for conflict. They're accelerationists. So they're looking for an opportunity to start the war they think they're going to win. And Trump has been playing into that by giving them an option, you know, telling them this will be your moment of glory. And it fits into history and how we've defined manhood and power in this country, which is you have to define an enemy, an enemy of your freedom, of your progress, and you'll win and that's success and that's manhood. And it's really this cowboy mythology that has followed not only in lineage, but in, you know, in history through many different areas of our culture. And we're seeing the danger that it brings today. Yeah. Um, the kind of anger that we saw in the rioters at the Capitol um, is often associated with the far right, but it is not the exclusive property of the far right, as you mentioned in the book. In fact, you, um, you devote a, a pretty good amount of, of space to the Bernie bros uh, on the opposite side. Um, talk a little bit about them and why you felt that they warranted a, a decent amount of ink in the book as well. You know, part of why I knew I needed to write about it was when it came out, I was writing this book, there were a lot of people who said, you're going to write about the Bernie brothers, right? And I got nervous. And I was like, oh, I don't want to bring that down on myself again. Like I immediately was like, oh, I don't want it. And then I realized, okay, so they've accomplished part of what they set out to do, right? Which was to make the cost of participation in this dialogue, this debate so high that I wouldn't want to talk about what happened. Uh, and I wasn't alone, you know? And that's when I realized, yes, like this is a phenomenon where, where I, I'm not usually shy. I'm not usually afraid to talk about a thing, but the thought of bringing that landslide of, you know, abuse and harassment my way uh, was not something I wanted to do, especially when I was writing it, right? Because I was, you know, I was writing this in, right in the beginning of the primary where we could have had Bernie Sanders as a, as a candidate and that would have increased the volume of everything. Yeah. And so I decided to write about it because I realized I wasn't alone and I was seeing plenty of peers who had endured so much abuse over the years since the 2016 election um, who were saying, I'm not saying anything this election, I'm gonna be silent. And I realized like the anger and that intimidation had worked. And so I decided to write about it. And I wanted to write about it, not because I had some sort of grudge against Bernie Sanders or even particularly against Bernie bros, but I wanted to talk about what happened because 
we see echoes of this in other spaces as well. And I want people to understand how there is no, you know, no political party that has exclusive rights to white male violence and intimidation. And I wanted people to see what happens and the dangers of that. And how, when I, talk, when I think about what stops us from moving forward, I think we are actually, it's actually far more dangerous to look at what stops us in the left from being able to push forward the ideals that we say we all believe in because we feel like we have to coddle white male sensitivity. Um, and we have to, you know, and we are subject to such anger when we move focus away from white men, even for a limited amount of time. I think that's far, you know, more hampering to our efforts than the people we knew were never, ever going to be supporting what we were doing, you know? And so I felt like it needed a place in the book. Uh, so by this time tomorrow, uh, we will have inaugurated uh, Kamala Harris as our first female uh, vice president and a woman of color as well. Um, does that give you hope for our country or are you concerned about backlash uh, in the way that we saw it after the election of President Obama? I mean, I, I think that you, there, it's both. I have hope and I know there will be backlash. And I think that's something that we have to understand is that what we saw even in the Capitol in these recent days is a backlash to progress, right? That will always come. And if, if there's one lesson I want people to get to the book, right, is how much not seeing and preparing and being committed to our ideals and pushing forward costs us every time the backlash comes and we move backwards. And we say, oh, you know, let's back off or we aren't prepared for it and it catches us off guard like we think it's not going to happen. It will always happen. And so the question then is, do we back off and start even further behind or do we keep pushing, knowing it's happening? Do we prepare? Do we try to minimize the impact it can have? And so I want people to go forward saying, you know what, the backlash is absolutely coming. So let's meet it. Let's meet it prepared and know what's going on and say, you know what, the dignity of people of color and women in this country is worth fighting for. Our progress, our ability to live up to our morals is worth fighting for, which means we're going to meet this backlash and keep our goals and keep moving forward. And, you know, instead we see often this, you know, well, hey, back off. And, and we're seeing the pressure right now, right? When we're looking at accountability for people who stormed federal buildings, people telling us, oh, you're just gonna make people more angry. Mm. Well, what, what are we gonna do to that anger when they learn they can storm a federal building and not be held accountable? The next time we do something that angers them, right? So it's all about deciding what we're committed to and recognize that there's nothing we can do to create progress that won't have a backlash. So we yeah. just have to be prepared for it and ready to meet it. Speaking of backlash, I wanna ask you about the squad. In fact, I wanna quote something that you said in the book. You said that any candidate of color who makes it to national politics will of course have to leave their racial identity behind in order to truly represent quote, real America. And there is no way that a woman of color who insists on fully representing her community and her values would ever be able to garner enough votes to win any major election. And I'm wondering how you square that then uh, with the squad and the fact that they've all been reelected and we have Kamala Harris now. Um, have you changed your mind about that since then? Um, no, I haven't actually. And, 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 and when you look at that chapter talking about them, we talk about the demographics of the areas they represented and why they were able to overcome that while appealing to their base. So what we had were you know, women of color, who were able to move past what would, you know, the platitudes and the base level expectations of representatives and try to forge new relationships. Um, some were in heavily, you know, uh, minority majority areas where perhaps, you know, it made more sense for them to appeal directly. Some were able to build solidarity on issues around class and you going and visiting people that eat white politicians thought didn't matter. They didn't have to visit anymore, right? It was about breaking from the norm, but they had to completely break from the norm. But at the same time, you see the cost that they paid, right? And that every day that they have been in office, they have had to battle in a way that representatives haven't had to. And that they have to have to battle their own party in a way that many representatives haven't had to because they are seen as fringe simply by insisting on bringing their whole selves to the office. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's vital to recognize, it doesn't mean that it's impossible. And I think we have to recognize we can make exceptions, but the fact that they are so exceptional, I think proves the rule that we have these mm -hmm. 
or women who are who are able to lead so boldly and so honestly and truly and for that they have to battle their own party they have to face regular threats and violence they have to battle you know their entire political opposition and they're regularly told that they represent a fringe interest even if that fringe interest is actually the needs of their constituents yeah you write at length about um, gender equality or the lack thereof, and one of the things that you talk about is a phenomenon called the glass cliff. Um, what is that, and how does that fit into the larger narrative of the book? The glass cliff is a phenomenon that was first um, seen in the in UK researchers and then um, researchers in the US started looking at it and saw it as well. But I think it's also something that many women and people of color in business have seen for themselves. And basically what they found was that there is really no better time that a woman or person of color will be picked. There is no time where they're more likely to be picked to lead a major organization than when that organization is deeply in trouble. Mm -hmm. And often what they see then is they are brought in kind of as a last ditch effort ever after everything has been tried to represent something new, but they aren't given the tools to succeed. And then when they fail, which is the cliff part of the glass cliff, the narrative is see women and people of color weren't good leaders. And a, usually a white man is brought in after they fail predictably um, to lead after that. And so it's called the glass cliff basically because you know, people think they've broken through a glass ceiling, but they're really on a cliff that they're about to be pushed off of. And we celebrate these appointments as if they are groundbreaking. And then the narrative when they fail is, oh, see, you know, we shouldn't have tried something new. And what's interesting about that too is researchers have found that when the opposite happens, when these women or people of color are successful, it doesn't actually shift public opinion about leadership of women or people of color. They are instead treated as exceptions. Said, oh, they're different than the norm. And so it's you know really a way that we continue to perpetuate racism and misogyny in business while pretending like we're not. Yeah. A couple of quick questions that I have remaining, and then I want to go to our audience questions. Um, you have a chapter on, on higher education, um, on the education system. And I was thinking about uh, Joseph Epstein, who was the, is the writer who came after Dr. Jill Biden about dropping the title doctor uh, from her name. And he is also a big critic of American higher education. Um, and I want to ask you um, a little bit about that about the ongoing attack because you, you have an entire chapter uh, where you talk about this attack on higher ed that can be traced back at least to the Reagan uh, administration. Can you connect the dots for us on that? Um, what do you see as kind of the relationship between white men and what you describe as the death of higher education in America? Yeah, so what I see it are two kind of power structures at play that many people are not aware of. One is the basic fact that our elites who are chosen to lead will always have access to the pinnacle of education. And from the beginning of higher education, it has been designed really to keep elite white men and elite white families in power. But in order for people to not understand that that's what drives it, to, to not feel you know like that's all there is, and in order for to make sure that power is concentrated, you have to then make sure that it's reserved for particular people. And I would say that as we had the expansion of higher education, um, these um, you know land grant colleges, which was basically an abundance of stolen land that needed to be filled, needed to be worked. We need to create this kind of level of education around agriculture, veterinary sciences, to be able to make the most of this expanded country. Um, education was opened up to middle classes for the first time, but that was a different level of education. And it also, it led to a huge amount of growth in middle class and stability for white families that they hadn't had before mm -hmm. and a new la economic ladder for white men that hadn't been available before. But once that started opening up and anytime it started opening up. So even before then, you know, in the early days of, you know, like our elite colleges like Yale and Princeton, as it started opening up to women, to people of color, 
it became a threat to the power structure. And so we have two things happening right now. One, we have that people see higher education as a threat, um, as, sorry, as less valuable because they no longer, white men can no longer use it to get as far as a leg up mm -hmm. on women and people of color when women and people of color now have access to it as well. Also, it's seen as less valuable because women and people of color attending colleges have, have been demanding since the 70s that education suit them as well. And so we see things like ethnic studies and race studies and these departments that white men view as a threat to themselves, their power and their identity. We also have seen that people who have an education that shows how our world works, how our politics work, are less likely to vote for Republicans and less likely to vote for conservatives. And so what we see then is this attack on higher education, one that feeds into this thought, it's not getting you your kids, it's not getting you what it used to, but that's all very strategic for a political party that needs people to not fully understand how our system works and needs people to not have the experience of being in close contact with women and people of color and sharing ideas and thoughts, which is what higher education wow. often provides. And so we see this war on it and we see, you know, these kind of attacks on studies that white men deem is not serious enough, on departments that they deem is not important. And the reason why is because it threatens the power structure. But it's important to note that through all these attacks on higher education, that the most of the people attacking it on our news stations from our government offices will absolutely still be sending their children to the best colleges that they can get them into. Mm. Yeah. Um Ichoma, you have paid a heavy price, you and your family, for the work that you do. And you talk about it in the book, about death threats, about hate mail, about uh, being doxxed, where your personal information is just kind of put out there for anybody to see, being swatted where, you know, someone calls and says that there's some sort of, you know, crime has been committed or something terrible has happened at your home and the SWAT teams have descended upon it. I mean, you have really paid a price for this. And I wonder in light of all that, what keeps you going? Why do you continue to do this work um, in light of the price that you and your family have paid? You know, Ahmaud Arbery was killed just for running through a neighborhood. Breonna Taylor was killed sleeping, right? Um, people, will harm us anytime we slightly inconvenience white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So part of what keeps me going is the knowledge that there's nothing I can do as a black woman that's going to make me immune from the dangers of violent white, white male supremacy. But at least I have a voice and at least I can fight it. Mm -hmm. And so many can't, you know, and so many didn't have a chance to. And if I have the ability to be heard, I have to, you know, I, I do this. I started this work after Trayvon Martin was killed. And what motivates me to do this work is not my own safety. It's knowing that none of us will be safe or feel free to walk down the street or drive our cars or go for a jog until these systems are taken down. And if I have a talent, and a way to help people see how we can do this, I have to do it. If I, if I gave it up today, I wouldn't sleep easier. You know, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't feel safer. I wouldn't, if a cop pulls up to me when I'm driving, I'm not thinking he must know I'm a writer who writes on race. I'm thinking I'm a black woman in this car and I have to figure out what I can do to make sure I don't get pulled over for anything, right? That reality waits for me. So it's not like I picked it up and I can put it down. Uh, and so that's why I do the work, you know, it's, I do the work because I want us all to be safe and I want us all to be free. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. I, we have some questions here uh, stacked up from our audience. So let's see how many of those we can get through. Uh, Virginia asks, how does the teaching of and consumption of history play into dismantling this pattern of mediocrity? A couple of things. One, I think because 
the way in which we talk about race um, and gender is often to treat everyone as an individual actor, and that's by design. So we don't actually look at the systems involved. And so that we think the solution is to like talk to each white man you know and try to win them over instead of looking at what we are perpetuating and supporting in the systems we are engaging with. In order to see how our systems work, we have to see how they've been working and how they were designed. We have to be able to see patterns if we want to know what's going to happen. But also, I think it's very vital that we counter the gaslighting that happens to people of color and women when they are met with these bigotries and these violence that tells them it's just in your head or you did something to deserve this or it didn't happen at all. We have to see the patterns of it to say, oh, not only did this happen to me, but it's happening all of the time and it needs to stop and the cost is real. Mm -hmm. And so understanding our history helps us. And I think if people had understood our history, if you had known the whole history of Buffalo Bill, and you know the harm that that cowboy mental mentality had wrought, we would be better prepared, more outraged at the Bundy brothers receiving such you know um, light punishment, no punishment for their crimes. If we had studied what happened with the Bundy brothers, we would be better prepared for what we've what we've seen in the Capitol today, right? And we would have said, absolutely, this violence is coming, and we have to make a strong show that we are against this. You know, we have to stop rewarding this behavior. We have to start holding elected officials who are encouraging this behavior accountable instead of now, where we're trying to determine what level of accountability might work. Uh, and so it's vital that we understand our history because it is absolutely repeating itself over and over and over. And if we don't get that and we don't get how our systems and our culture are perpetuating it, we won't be able to make a change. Yeah. Uh, follow up to that uh, from Gotti, who says, what can people do on a local level and in their everyday lives to reduce racial inequality and help inform their white friends that may not see white male mediocrity? I would say locally is where you actually need to do the work more than anything else. A lot of times we focus nationally, especially when we have had a president who so loudly espouses this kind of hatred and division. But the reason why he rose to power is because on a local level, we've been supporting and allowing this behavior in our city councils, our school boards, and then our state reps, and then our senators and our house reps, right? So it's, it's vital that we look locally first. And so one is to figure out what is happening in your area. If you don't know what is, you know, what the income differential differentials are between people of color and white people in your local area, you're not going to be able to speak to income inequality. If you don't know how many kids of color are being suspended or arrested in your local public schools, you're not going to be able to speak to mass incarceration of youth of color, right? If you don't understand what the sexual assault rates are in your area or what the um, you know, conviction rates of rapists are in your area, you're not going to be able to speak to safety and sexual violence in your area, right? All of these things you need to know. And then what you need to look at is say, where do I interact with this? So once you have that information, you know where you interact with that systems, then share that information. A lot of times people are able to believe that there is no problem because they are capped from seeing the real scope of things. So figure it out yourself first, share the information. Say, Did you know this is happening in our schools? Did you know this is happening in our local businesses? Did you understand you know, how the lack of affordable housing we have in our neighborhood and what that does to families of color? Right? Talk about that and then talk about the history and then say what you plan on doing and invite people to join you, right? Yeah. And talk about why it's important that they enjoy, that they join you. And so a lot of times people wanna say, how do I talk to my friends and my neighbors? But instead I want, I want you to think, how can I show them? How can mm -hmm. I lead by example and show my path and my journey and my work so that people will want to join me in it? Yeah. Question about the glass cliff. Uh, in reference to the glass cliff, could we be seeing a shift in that where Joe Biden is uh, going on that cliff to try and repair issues in the country before a woman or person of color succeeds him? Um, you know, sort of, no, not really. You know, I, I think that people have a lot of wishful thinking. <laughs> In, in dark ways over what these, these years might bring. Um, but no, because here's what I think. The glass cliff is not necessarily he's going to try to fix this so that then if something happens to him and a woman of color comes in next, she will inherit a great thing. It's important to recognize that 
the rule of the glass cliff will still continue if we don't address what's behind it. And if we want to look at that, just look at Obama, right? Look at the economy that he left that was greater, <laughs> better, and stronger. Look at, you know, who will honestly go down in history as regard, I mean, and he was a centrist and every president we have is a war criminal to some degree. He will still go down as probably our most competent and most successful president that we have had in this country. And yet he's, he will then, he's seen as a failure to people who do not want to see him in leadership, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so to whatever he was unable to fix, he's blamed for. Whatever he was able to fix, people erase. And I think that if we aren't careful, if we as the public don't become you know, strident watchdogs of our history and how it's being written, the same thing will happen to Kamala should she come to office as president. So it's really about what we allow. It's not even about what Biden can do. Yeah. It's about what we do as an American public and, and how closely we watch media and the conversations we're having with our peers and how we support and enable her to lead. And so she will still be coming into a leadership position that has been predominantly white and male. She will still have to work with people who do not want her to succeed. Biden will not be able to change that <laughs> in her, you know, in her favor. We are going to have to be the watchdogs on that if we don't want her situation to be another glass cliff, should it come to her being president. Yeah. Uh, Kia asks, uh, Kia says, I am a white woman and my son is black. As a black woman with a white mom, what was the most valuable thing that your mom did for you while growing up to help you recognize and maintain your most true self? Um, one, she called us black, which was vital. And she acknowledged it and leaned into it and, and didn't act like it was a threat to our relationship. So when I give talks, you know, back when we used to give talks in person, and, and someone would ask me about my experience, you know, as a mixed race black person and ask me about my mom and I would talk about what it meant to feel affirmed, to, to never feel like I had to leave part of my identity behind. Mm -hmm. There was always a mixed race person in the audience who breaks down crying, no matter what age, middle age, 50s, 40s, 20s, because the trauma of feeling like your white parent doesn't actually see you see the most visible part of you that you walk through the world in, um, doesn't leave. And so as weird as my mom was, as many, you know, cringeworthy things she's done, and she was not perfect, of course, never having to feel like I had to hide my blackness or debate her about it or assert it with her, feeling like it was a beautiful thing that she welcomed in our home mm. meant the world to me. And it has meant a lot to my identity and how I've moved through the world. And I think it's one of the most valuable things you can do um, if you are a white parent of a black child. Wow. Um, this question, let me just go up here. Joan says, you talk a lot about the dangerous legacy of white male America. What part do you see white women play in maintaining this dangerous legacy? Yeah, definitely. And part of the reason why, you know, a lot of people have asked why isn't this white men and white women? And part of it is because what I'm looking at is the political structure, the power structure, right? But we all play a part in some more than others. And so I think it's really vital. And I hope that when white women read this book, they're not looking for just their own personal validation, but instead seeing where they have been complicit because white women have absolutely many times throughout our history and in present day, many have decided that they are willing to change, to trade any real liberation for their proximity to white male power. Mm -hmm. And so it is vital that we look at the ways in which this is upheld and, and how many white women have decided they are not willing to risk the security that they may get false or not from their husbands, their brothers, their sons. Um, and recognize how often they are willing to violate not only, you know, their supposed bonds with other people of color, with people of color, but their own morals in order to maintain that sense of power. It's important to recognize that that will always get in the way of their own liberation. And so if there's one thing that I think really struck me in the book work as I finished is recognizing that women's liberation, white women's liberation is absolutely tied to ridding this country of white supremacy because mm -hmm. 
the patriarchy in this country requires both, both sexism and racism to thrive. And that is something that I think a lot of white women haven't realized. That as long as white supremacy exists, they will never see the liberation that they seek. And a lot of white women still think that they can find their way to work around it, to get their freedom without actually having to truly ally themselves to people of color and without actually having to deconstruct the white supremacy that gives them a proximity to power. Question from Matthew, uh, who is a university level writing instructor and says, as a writer, what are your thoughts about how educational practices, especially in writing, privilege or center ways of using language that conform to the expectations of quote, standard read white American English. It's clear that teaching students to master those conventions isn't going to undo structural racism, but is there something better we can do instead? Yeah, I mean, I think it's so interesting to me as a writer um, to see how much white supremacy really is in the writing field. And I mean, especially academic writing. So if you are in academia of any sort, um, academic writing, I, I find can often be incredibly problematic. It kind of, um, yeah. It, it's just, it becomes very self-focused because you have this kind of rabbit hole of people who've obtained a certain ideal of language in order to get into that space and then writing for people who expect that language and all of it is kind of exempt from the people who are most impacted um, by the words that are being written. And so I think it's really vital that we look at that, but also it's really important to look at the fact that, you know, language is a human construct, right? That we are coming up with it. And we have to know the history of white supremacy in our language. We have to know the history of classism in our language. So that if we ever want to hear stories from people who write differently and speak differently, that we don't, you know, continuously erase them and kick them out, we have to confront that. It's also important to recognize because I fundamentally believe that any writing that communicates effectively with your intended audience is valid. And so the thought that I would have to translate my writing to a white audience, if I'm not writing to a white audience is absurd to me. And yet academia says that time and time again. And yet no one says to white writers do you think that a black kid in a black neighborhood is going to get what you're saying? Could you translate that for them? Yeah. Right. And there's the white supremacy in that. Yeah. And so it is vital that we recognize and pull that apart because we are missing so many important narratives, but also it shows a lack of faith in white readers. Mm. I have managed to read so many things that were not written for me. And I've been able to use context clues. I've been able to use my dictionary. I've been able to use the internet to figure out what's being said. And it has helped me grow. Yeah. But at the same time, it's also harmful to know that I have never been the intended audience of entire sectors of the writing world. If you are a white person reading, almost everything has been tailored to you. And you haven't had to do the work that would connect you to different ideas, different voices, different ways of thinking and speaking. You, you wouldn't have to dig into the history of a phrase and figure out why it matters, right? Um, all of that is taken from you because white academia thinks that you're not capable, that you don't have the patience, the time, the ability, that you don't love words enough, that you don't want to understand enough. That's incredibly pessimistic to me. And I think we have to start having more faith in white readers to be able to read something kind of outside of what they've all, always known. But also words change, you know? When I started writing, I have a degree in political science. So I don't have, you know, an English degree, a journalism degree. And so I write the way I talk. And the outrage at first, when I would show up, say, in The Guardian, and people would be like, why is she talking like this in The Guardian? She sounds like a blogger, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then watching as the authenticity of my words caught on. Mm. And watching then all of a sudden people mimicking it, and not just me, but of course, so many other, especially Black women and, and queer people of color who've been writing online for a long time because they realized it appealed that they were actually reaching a new audience. It's, it's, it's been really hilarious. And yet then you see the gatekeeping still move because people will write me and say, I don't write like you, I don't talk like you. 
so I'm never going to get published, right? <laughs> like, you know? And so I, I, for me, it's just the amount of battles that I have had to have over the years where I've had to remind publishers, you know, editors, especially online, that you wanted a black woman to write this, but you don't want me to sound like a black woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and that there's something seriously wrong with that. And it really stops our work from appealing and it cuts entire voices mm -hmm. out of our narrative. And it also really does, it, it also really does uphold white male mediocrity because anyone who can mimic that tone that's expected. Mm -hmm. And I have read absolutely crap articles, crap books that manage to use the tone expected of like white male academia. And you read it and you're like, there's no there there, you know? Mm. Um, because we aren't actually looking at what's being said. We're looking at, you know, it's it's the equivalent of the suit and the tie in book form where you're like, oh, it looks professional. It must be, it must be right. They use this big word. They must know what they're saying. And, and we haven't gotten into it really. Yeah. Hmm. Question from Lauren who says, I am a sixth grade teacher with Black History Month coming up, I am planning on talking about race, uh, what is going on in the world today, and the historical contexts. What do you think is the most important thing for me to tell my sixth grade students? You know, if I was to give advice, one thing I would say is move Black History Month to something that happens throughout the year. Mm. And then give your students, all of your students, a chance to celebrate Blackness in February. A lot of what happens when I talk to students, one of my favorite things to do, especially when I was on like traditional tours is to find a school to sit and hang out with middle schoolers, you know, say, how's it going? And we would talk about class and talk about how they learn about race and the amount of dread that they had for February, just absolute dread was palpable because they're wow. like, this is, this is our traumatic month. This is where we see pictures of people who look like us getting sprayed with fire hoses, getting you know lynched, getting beaten, getting put in jail, being mm -hmm. murdered. And then we ne were never spoken of again, right? right? That history matters, but I think it matters more in context. Everything that you teach in school has a racial aspect and you should be teaching that and that history throughout the year. And then give some time to celebrate and uplift and make February a celebration, a time where we look at grand accomplishments, where white students as well can look at their peers of color and say, wow, you could be a leader. You know, you are who I'm going to look to as well, because it's not just black students and what they're learning or not learning. It's also what white students are learning as well. And so that's the recommendation I would give and make that a time also to center the voices of your black students. Mm. So that they can decide how they want to be represented in, you know, in this month as well. Yeah, great advice, great idea. Um, Thomas wants to know, can you say a little more about the connection with the Bernie Bros? Uh, he says, I haven't received the book yet, and how patriarchal behavior on the left and right mirror each other. Yeah, you know, so what was interesting the, around this phenomenon, I think it's important to recognize that it wasn't specifically just tied to Bernie, right? So it wasn't, there was something special about Bernie Sanders. I would have voted for Bernie Sanders. And I'm not even just saying that, like I would have gladly voted for Bernie Sanders because he did have the most progressive ticket. But the, the idea that everything still has to center white men stops us from living up to our values. And I would say that his campaign and the way in which he consistently refused to even for a second pull discussion away from white men and focus on the needs that women and people of color had because he was so afraid of alienating white men um, showed how he himself were, was violating his own core principles because you cannot effectively tackle issues of economic injustice which was at the center of his campaign without looking at race and gender if you don't you're just going to create a new hierarchy where women and people of color are still below poor white men who are being lifted up, right? If you don't look at how race and gender factor in. Um, and so what we see is the anger when white men feel threatened and feel decentered from a space that they feel they should always be centered in. It looks the same regardless of party. And so we had white men who had signed on to support politically what should be you know, a very equitable campaign that had ideals that should be lifting everyone up. 
and they and, and were spending their time on the internet attacking women and people of color who dared critique their president or who, who, their candidate or who dared bring focus away from them and their goals mm. and really in violation of what they said they stood for and that i want people to look at and say not say oh well then this means we should never support bernie sanders but instead say this is a this is a problem that will come up time and time and time again as we try to move forward politically and we have to find a way to solve it because we actually can't accomplish what we want to and live up to our ideals if everything has to be centered in the needs of white men and if any progress that focuses on women and people of color will be seen as a threat and there are definite times where, I mean, I would sit there and look at the messages that I and my friends, my peers would get for mildest critiques and try to see a difference in the vitriol between what I was getting from Trump supporters and what I was getting from Bernie Sanders supporters, and I couldn't see it. Wow. And that shows a huge problem. And it's something that, you know, when we saw this and we saw what happened with that election, when we saw polls and studies showing that there were a sizable amount of white men on the left who will never support a woman candidate, that's a problem that we have to recognize and deal with because we're not gonna be able to move forward. And anytime we try to touch on political progress that doesn't center white men, we're going to see this massive failure like we saw in 2016. Well, we are almost out of time here, but uh, see if we can squeeze in a question from Grace who asks, do you believe racism can truly be eradicated? I don't know if racism itself can truly be eradicated, but I believe that the systems that support it and increase the impact it can have on the lives of people of color can absolutely be changed and demolished where need be. And, and that's really where my concern is. I am not saying I want a world where I know I walk down the street and no one's thinking ill of me because of the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. But I do think we can have a world where I walk down the street and someone knows they can't get away with harming me or discriminating against mm -hmm. me because of the color of my skin. That I think is doable. And that's what I think we should aim for. Yeah. So uh, Lisa uh, sends a lovely compliment to you, um, says that this is the third time that she has seen you on this tour and she feels like this has been the best one yet and that you are just brilliant. So some lovely words there from Lisa for you. Um, Ijoma, before we wrap, I've, I've been asking people that I have the privilege of interviewing, um, you know, in, in light of the year that we've just come out of, uh, you know, COVID, uh, the, the political mess. And now, you know, 2021 has, has not started off in an auspicious way. Um, in light of all of that, what gives you hope? Um, you know, what gives me hope, honestly, is the fact that we're still fighting, that we're still here, and that we still create space for love and joy and to support each other. You know, that mm -hmm. even though everything is against us, we still, we still understand that we are worthy of joy and safety and love and happiness. And I, I hope that we recognize and center that more because no one is gonna do that work but us. And in that vein of uplifting as well, I want to make a brief statement in support of the workers of the, of the Free Library. And please check out their efforts to try to combat racism at the library, because we do need to uplift each other and support each other and recognize that people continue this fight day in and day out. And that's what keeps me going. Looking at people, you know, looking at young people who perhaps came of age with the killing of Trayvon Martin, who may be, you know, young Black people who may have no idea to think that this world is worth fighting for, and yet they do. Like, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful, and we have to. So speak up where you can, support where you can, do what you can, and recognize that we're in a long history, a long lineage of people who have done that, and that's why we're here today. Yeah, well, I think that's the perfect note to end on. Ijoma Oluo, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us, for putting this book into the world and for all that you are teaching us through your work. Um, I do want to thank all the folks at the library, Andy Cahan and the whole author events team, Megan, our interpreter, for being with us as well. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us from all over the place to be a part of this great conversation. Thank you all so much. Here's to brighter days for all of us as we move forward in 2021. Thanks again, everyone. Good night.